Hey there, I'm Scott, and this is Tangents. Well, it is May 27, 2021, while I'm recording this, which happens to be my birthday. I'm not a big birthday guy. It's um, It's been quite a long time since I've really done much to celebrate. Um, although, I'm working today, which I'd kind of rather not be doing. Just, although, honestly, it's not that I don't like work. It's just I would kind of like, um, like some time off. You know, like a real needy chunk of time off. Um, it's not even that I'm doing necessarily that much. It's just that it's kind of like this relentless grind and most of the stuff I'm doing, frankly, is dumb and I'm working on projects that I don't really believe in or don't really have much interest in. And um, they're from customers who are paying us, which is nice. Uh, and I realize also most people, you know, most people's jobs probably much shittier than mine. So I try to be cognizant of that. But at the same time, I just don't don't like it, and uh, it's it's frustrating, you know, and it's it's tiring. If if I was sleeping consistently, I don't think I'd mind it so much. But the combination of just this relentless grind and uh, you know, like working on stuff that, in some cases, I think it is like sketchy at best, and then uh, I mean, some things are are okay, but some things are just not great. And, um, and then on top of that, you know, being tired all the time and the, the being tired just, it permeates every fucking little bit of my life. It's kind of, um, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm trying to do, I'm always like, I've got weights on me. You know, I feel like I'm being dragged behind. I, uh, I'm walking through a viscous swamp. You know, just like you're using so much effort and um, walking through the snow without snowshoes, you know, extra effort and making much less progress than you could be. Now, luckily for me, I happen to be relatively effective and efficient. And so I think despite that, I still do a decent job of some stuff, but it's just, it gets to me. I, I really, I really find I'm, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of being tired. So I don't want to harp on that, but that's just uh, where I am. Um, maybe someday I'll have a vacation and uh, like a real vacation and that will be like enough to like, I don't know, reset stuff or maybe I'll also have less, uh, you know, th things are getting more stable in terms of um, I'm getting paid consistently, have been for a while now. Um, my business partners, increased my salary and his as well. And, you know, things are slowly in some sense coming together, but it's just so slow and so frustrating. And uh, like there, there are a million things I would rather do with the very limited amount of time that I have. I am very acutely aware, you know, I'm not just because of my birthday, but I, I see where I am. I see where I'd like to be. And it's not that I even have a specific, like I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. It's just that I want to be on a trajectory that's better. And the trajectory I'm on now, it's not terrible, mind you, but it's just not great, you know? And there's so many things that I, like, I, I would much rather be working on stuff that I didn't think was a stupid waste of time. You know, I'd much rather be working on stuff that was not, you know, that was my own, if it is dumb, if it's a waste of time, if it's a bad project that's never gonna go anywhere, I, I want it to be at least mine, you know? I want to have a budget for that and resources and people that I can, uh, you know, like an engineering team rather than just, um, you know, having all of those things, but kind of focusing on stuff that I don't really care about. And given my druthers, I'd never even think about. Um, I, I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night worrying about stuff for some of these projects. And it's like, I, I don't want to be, you know, it's bad enough to like, I probably would be waking up worrying about other stuff if it wasn't for that. But I'd much rather be waking up and worrying about something that I thought mattered, you know? And I don't think these things matter. And, you know, I, I mean, obviously in the large sense, nothing really matters if you wanna get, like you zoom out to a certain extent and obviously just microbes on a speck of dust in a little corner of the universe, nothing matters. But things do matter to us microbes, 
you know, and uh, we can make a difference in other microbes' lives. Or we can sit here and work on stupid shit and uh, whittle away the very limited amount of time that we have um, working on dumb shit. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, some of the stuff that I'm doing is preparing me perhaps, arguably, if you want to be really generous, for doing other stuff that's more interesting. But I still, like, yeah, I just, I just fucking want, you know, and, and I, I, again, acutely aware enough, you know, I'm, I'm in a relatively privileged place here, but I would much rather just have funding and resources and work on my own shit than be doing these dumb contracts. And, and it's just, it's relentless, and it also just, I don't see, I, I see some path forward. You know, I do, like, there are lights at the end of the tunnel. But it still just feels like, um, I don't know, I, I, in order to continue along this path, we're kind of constantly taking on more work. And then we are building up resources to accommodate that work, but the work that we are taking on slightly exceeds our current capacity every time. And then you build up to that, and you, you know, it's kind of this uh, seesaw, which is good to grow. But it's also like, you know, it, it, again, it's not that I want to sit back and just fuck around. Um, it's just that I would like to work on other stuff. I would like to not be working on stupid shit. Um, you know, and, and it's just like, I, I find it, I find it kind of disgusting and offensive and it annoys the shit out of me, frankly, that I see people who have funding and the ability to pay us to work on stupid shit and they're doing stupid shit. And then I'm like, uh, I, I take it honestly as a personal failing. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, and people do tell me, it's like, well, Scott, it helps to be a sociopath because some of these guys with a lot of money, uh, they're just basically lying and all this stuff. And I'm, I'm not saying, I'm suggesting that I be a sociopath, but I am saying that they're saying that, you know, like, oh, it's somehow a good thing and a virtue that you don't have money because that means you're not a sociopath. It's like, well, okay, on one hand, sure. On the other hand, you know, couldn't we just not have to be sociopaths to have, you know, resources? Um, it, it, it's so fucked up. We're an insanely wealthy civilization, uh, have more money, more resources than any other humans in the entirety of human history. And uh, yet, almost all of that is concentrated in, like, you know, double-digit numbers of people. You know, a approaching 10 billion people on the planet. And, you know, of that, like, 10 billion people, something like 100 control the vast, vast majority of everything. And, I mean, you think about it, it's just, now, granted, marginally better than having an emperor, I guess. You know, you don't have uh, that exactly, but you still have a lot of people that have so much outweighed, outsized power. Uh, and, and a lot of them also are just, you know, I don't know, you look at the Cokes, and they, they've done so much harm, these fuckers. They have so much money. They've accumulated so much more money. And... They, they're sitting there actively mucking with our democracy, uh, pushing for a constitutional convention to completely fuck over almost everybody. And they've got people convinced that it's a good thing. Um, I, I mean, it's just like, and the, the gullibility of people. Um, and, and when I say this, I don't just mean the, the MAGA, like Trump supporters. The, obviously they're fucking horrible. But I mean also, like, people who nominally you would think would be better. I mean, uh, you know, and, and I, I love and respect, uh, I'm not even going to say his name. Somebody who watches this, very big uh, fan of, we're friends, all of this, or listens rather, I guess I should say. But, you know, I, I hear things like, oh, Biden is the perfect guy for this time, I guess, because, you know, he's not, he's just kind of like, quietly doing stuff in the background. And, and yeah, okay, maybe, kind of, ish. Uh, but most of what he's doing is not that great. Most of it is falling so 
far short of actually what is needed. And most of the reason that it's falling short has nothing to do with, uh, you know, the, like completely insane MAGA people. It has to do with the cinemas and the mansions and frankly the Bidens who are sitting there like actively standing in the way of progress, uh, covering, covering student loan debt. Um, this is one that personally would affect me massively. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm at least in a position and on a trajectory where I could plausibly, not necessarily, but I could, there's a realistic scenario where in the next few years I could completely obviate mine. Um, but that's because I'm doing something that the vast majority of people can't even fucking think about doing. And my situation is still shitty. And, you know, so I'm, I'm like privileged and still kind of fucked over. And I think about all the people who are just sitting there working these, you know, very hard jobs, uh, spending, you know, I, one of the baristas at uh, the Dutch Brothers I go to, um, she said that uh, she's working like 60 hours a week. And these are jobs like Dutch Brothers and uh, another sort of service job, actually also at a weed dispensary. And, you know, there are things that are not very mentally or intellectually taxing necessarily, but you do have to be like communicative. You have to be on at Dutch Brothers. I mean, I guess the people they're selecting there um, are adapted to it, kind of. But I know personally, if I had to, you know, I, I have meetings not quite all day, every day, but every day I have a bunch of meetings. And I just find it draining. You know, even when they're good meetings, even when they're meetings with people that I like, I just, you know, I just fucking need time to myself. You know, I just, and I, I don't have, I don't have even one day of the week where it's just time to myself. I have, I'm supposed to have um, meeting free Tuesday uh, but Tuesdays always got, you know, at least like three or four meetings. And that's my low meeting day. Uh, and it's just like, I, I, I just, I, I can't fucking take it. You know? And at a certain point, like, I'm, I'm also very acutely aware I could be working at ASU and making like twice what I'm making now. Um, and maybe without quite as, you know, large of a potential exit. But the exit that may exist in the future is not guaranteed. Um, and the amount of work and time and effort and just struggle that goes into that is so disproportionate. And again, most people don't have those options. Most people can't even consider either of those. They're just stuck uh, working minimum wage and working, you know, probably more than 40 hours a week doing really just grinding stuff. And uh, it's, it's so fucked up. And the thing, the, the thing that I want to talk about today, specifically, is supply. And what do you mean by, what do you mean by supply? How do you, you know, how does this connect to everything you just said? Well, supply, I mean in terms of resources, and I mean in terms of, uh, you know, money if you like, but mainly resources, time, effort, all of this kind of stuff. Um, all of the things that money essentially buys. And uh, one of the, re the reason I want to talk about this, um, it, it connects to a bunch of things, you know, like at the beginning of the pandemic a year ago, there was this weird run on toilet paper. People had this crazy obsession. I, I guess the best explanation I can come up with is that people have a very poor understanding of what illness is. And uh, so they didn't, they don't know what a respiratory illness is. Uh, they just kind of think of every illness as kind of like mashed together and maybe they thought that it was a GI issue and maybe they thought you were just going to like shit your brains out. I don't know. Whatever it was, people decided um, we're not going to, we're going to run out of toilet paper, uh, which is crazy because the supply chain, it's actually an interesting thing. Um, I'm, there's no way in hell I'm going to actually talk about this, but I'm sure somebody has gone into this and it's worth looking into just how efficient and well-oiled the supply chain is for toilet paper. Uh, the production of toilet paper is a relative constant, uh, constant but slowly growing. And 
you know, there's lead time for it, but it's very difficult actually to throttle it, interestingly. But, you know, so if there's a sudden spike or lull in demand, you can't really ramp it up or down that fast. But as long as demand is relatively constant, which it should be under normal circumstances, um, toilet paper is, is essentially a thing that we should never, ever, ever, um, under our current circumstances, have a shortage of. The only reason that you would have a shortage of it is that people start hoarding it. And so, you know, we have this, um, that's just one example. Uh, another one is gasoline. Uh, there was a, a hack um, into a pipeline, and the, this was an interesting one because the hack was not into the pipeline control system itself, but essentially into the billing system. And it's one of these cases there are a ton of these, just mostly quiet, but all over the fucking place. A uh, large number of like Russian, Eastern European, maybe other, but they're essentially there, hackers target some organization, crack into their shit, uh, encrypt everything, steal the data, and then, you know, they threaten to release it. And, you know, so partly your shit's going to get out there. Partly, the, the threat used to be, we're just going to destroy your data. We're not going to give you the decryption key if you don't pay. Um, and, of course, paying, I, I, I despise Bitcoin for, like, a fuck ton of reasons. But paying, this is awesome, is through Bitcoin, generally speaking. Or some other cryptocurrency, but Bitcoin, essentially. And the reason for this is that, despite the fact that everyone on the blockchain has a record of every transaction, it still makes it easy to kind of hide, to do sort of black and gray market transactions, to move money around, uh, to extract it at some other end without uh, having an obvious chain. You could probably do some forensic accounting there, although it's probably pretty difficult and very difficult to prove. So, you know, they uh, actually cracked into my system years ago, cracked into my, well, she doesn't work there anymore, but the, the hospital my sister used to work at most of the time cracked in there, held the thing hostage, and then they ended up paying, I, I think it was less than a million. It was like hundreds of thousands of dollars, but maybe it was in the millions, but it was a lot of money. They ended up paying to get their shit decrypted. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because these companies, the insurance companies, whoever, they look at this, and this is the same reason that there are so many... Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan, generally speaking, of lawsuits and all of this kind of stuff. But there are frivolous claims often made. Um, you know, generally, like somebody gets bumped and then they they get the neck brace out and they're you know going this whole thing. Um, the insurance company pays that off because they're like, well, okay, we know that they're full of shit, but the cost of defending against it it far exceeds what the payoff would be or payout would be to just make the thing go away. Now, of course, the problem with that is that that is a, it's the same thing as me voting for Joe Biden um, or, or McSinema, because I vote for McSinema and because I'm saying like McSally is so fucking horrible. I vote for Biden because Trump is so fucking horrible. Now, if there was one election ever and there was never gonna be another one, that is a completely rational and reasonable and I would say correct decision. It gets complicated when you consider that there are many, many games. It's not a single round. It's like every couple of years, new election. Every couple of years, you find yourself in the same position and it's like somebody horrible or somebody slightly less horrible. And you keep doing that and the slightly less horrible keeps ratcheting up and getting worse and the slightly hor or the horrible person keeps getting worse. Partly, partly frankly, boosted by the less horrible person because you know, the, the Democrats, I mean, you know, the Pied Piper fucking thing for, for Trump, they're creating adversaries who are easy to go like, hey, look at how fucking horrible they are. You totally don't want to vote for Trump. You don't want to let him get in. You got to vote for Biden. I'm sorry. It's just, I don't like it either. You know, you have to, you know, I mean, there's shit that people say about this stuff. It's just, it makes me want to scream. So you have that kind of situation. And again, you know, because it's round after round, you start thinking like, 
well, maybe the insurance companies are wrong in their strategy. Like maybe they should actually fight it because despite the fact that, you know, it's going to cost way more, if people know that you're going to fight against a frivolous suit um, or you're not going to pay it out, you're going to spend, you know, whatever it costs to fix things, um, you stop doing it. Like the, the whole problem goes away because there's no reward to it anymore. And so when you have a multi-round game, I mean, you have to at least think of it strategically like that, especially if, you know, it's one of the, one of the problems of, I'd say, insurance companies because, and, and in fact, not just insurance companies, but almost every kind of company and organization, it's not just that they're being taken over or being, they've been taken over by finance guys. It's that the finance guys are exceedingly short-sighted. Everything, every decision is like a one round game and they're just maximizing short-term profit in the next quarter or sooner based on that. Um, and so you end up with really terrible decisions. So probably not gonna edit that out, but if you heard that, there was a giant fucking noisy ass truck or motorcycle or whatever outside. I, I, I gotta tell you, like, I, I, really, I, I walk around all the time, um, and you know, granted, I have a car that's pretty quiet, but I have a lot of neighbors who have just loud fucking, you know, beasts of vehicles, and they're intentionally loud. I mean, we have the technology to make things much quieter, um, and I'm not just talking about, like, the two-stroke engine where you have, like, the little uh, horn muffler to make it louder, um, you know, to make it scream and whine. I'm talking about like normal-ish vehicles and they're just so fucking loud, needlessly loud. And it's so just obnoxious. It's like, that's, that's awesome. The whole world is looking at you. Bravo, bravo, you, know, you got my attention. You know, I'm so wet because <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, my knees are weak and I am totally wet because your fucking Harley is making all of these farty sounds. Yeah. Bravo, fucking asshole. So anyway, um, this, this thing about ro single round versus multi-round games, it's a big problem. The finance guys intrinsically wouldn't be so bad if they were looking at long term versus next quarter. If the rewards were for, you know, like even a few years out, or even like, I mean, imagine 10 or 50 years out versus next quarter. And I mean, the problem is of course, you end up with things like Boeing where, yeah, it's much cheaper to just fire a bunch of the good engineers and kind of like plow through things. It's much cheaper to not create a new airframe, you know, clean sheet design and do things right. Much, much cheaper to use the old 737, tweak it a little bit and then just kind of like patch on this little, uh, thing to control, um, you know, to kind of compensate for the fact that you've really made something that shouldn't work or is not really the best possible design. And then, you know, well, we have people who kind of work for the FAA who also work for us. We can just get rubber stamps from. Sounds great. And then you kill a couple planes for the people. Um, yeah, probably not that cheap in the long run. I mean, it basically, I'm not saying it destroyed Boeing, obviously they're still here, but did a fucking hell of a job on the company, gave Airbus a huge leg up. Uh, similarly also, like Starliner, I mean, this is a thing, like, could have been a, yeah, I, I have problems obviously with the SLS and all of this, um, but Starliner and SLS could have been fine, but they're so fucked up in so many different ways and it's the same thing. It's these bean counters just finding ways to cost cut and improve short-term profit, reduce short-term loss. And then they end up making something that's so shitty that they can't even fly it and end up, you know, like um, just handing SpaceX essentially. Um, and and I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Elon Musk, but I mean, SpaceX has flight hardware that works and that is apparently safe. And, um, you know, Boeing is just sitting there with their fucking dick in the air, 
um, you know, Starliner that has hundreds of thousands of major issues that need to be resolved. Um, I mean, it's, it's impressively bad how fucked up this shit is. And, and that number, I'm not, I'm not just pulling out like a you know, magical exaggerated number. I mean, they literally had, um, after their, their sort of quasi failed launch, literally had into the hundreds of thousands of issues, a lot of them pretty significant that needed to be resolved before it could get rated. Um, so that's, you know, it's crazy. Like to get that many issues, is, it, it's almost hard to conceive of. Uh, now, granted, this is a complicated system, but, you know, that's a lot of fucking problems to have. So, back to supply. Um, you had this gas thing. Uh, I don't want to get too much into this, but, I mean, it's just ridiculous that people free... First off, the oil companies fucked with the supply because they couldn't build people um, or couldn't track usage and this kind of stuff. That alone was kind of inconvenient, but it would have been survivable. But then people panicked and bought, in, in some cases, like literally trash bags full of gas, which seems insane to me because, you know, organic salt and plus plastic, probably not the best or wisest thing you could do. I don't know, call me crazy. Um, but they did this. And in the process of doing that, created a shortage, just like this fucking toilet paper thing. Um, in the electronics world, there are, there's a worldwide supply shortage and it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Actually, I have to say, cause some of the projects we're working on, it, it, it's just like there will be parts in stock and you feel kind of okay. And then all of a sudden the worldwide supply dries up and the lead time is like 26 weeks or in many cases, 52 weeks plus. Um, and, and you're like, what the fuck? And it's not just the part that you used, it's like every vaguely comparable part gets bought up. Now, I don't know that people are actually using all of these. I think a lot of it is like people are panic buying shit. And panic buying, you know, it's probably really nice for the silicon, the IC companies, except for the fact that they're kind of like, people are like, oh, I need my shit. Well, we can't get it for a year. Like, ah, but what are you gonna do? Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's some more shit. But anyway, this is a thing that we're running into. And again, there are real problems that are constraining things. There were, there's a fire at a fab. Fabs are very expensive and they take a long time to replace. Uh, the freeze in Texas fucked up a bunch of stuff in warehouses and ended up you know, causing a big supply crunch in materials and some other things. Um, the stupid fucking boat in the Suez Canal has the, the impact of something that dumb um, on global supply chain is just ridiculous. Uh, it tells you actually kind of, I, I, I'm a big, I don't want to say fan, but I, I think a lot about how much the world is dependent um, often on people who are not getting paid very much. And frankly, just to like get a little dig against cops and people who are not getting paid very much and whose jobs are much, much, much more dangerous and deadly than cops like the people collecting garbage and the people growing our food, um, those groups of people, you know, if, and this is a thing, I mean, just kind of hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, if those people would stop working collectively, even for a matter of weeks, it would wreak havoc. And, you know, I mean, like in terms of bargaining power, in terms of like, if, if if garbage people across the planet went on a strike, uh, literally for like a week or two, it's it's ridiculous. I've been in both Paris and New York during a garbage strike, and it is crazy how quickly just shit tons of things just pile up on the sidewalks. And you're like, how, how, how is this even possible? Um, you know, I mean, it's not something that's like necessarily a hazard to human life. You could kind of say like, you know, hey, you want us to work, um, maybe pay us more, maybe give us better benefits. Um, it's, it's a negotiating point that people just don't take in, into advantage, take into account. Um, one, one related one is fucking NBA players. I'll tell you, I, 
I've grown over the past few years uh, from really liking and respecting and kind of admiring President Obama to just kind of despising the guy. And I mean, one of the reasons was the accelerate the end game shit uh, about a year ago, a little bit more, uh, knocking Bernie out. The stuff that he did there, and this is not like some crazy conspiracy theory, the stuff that he did that is documented that people, uh, people including him, have admitted to, um, just disgusting. Um, I used to think, okay, like he had two years. He and Pelosi had two years where they had Democratic majority in the House, the Senate, and the President. And in that time, they did fuck all. They got the ACA passed. You know, that's great. But the ACA um, was basically, you know, I mean, it, and again, it's better than not having the ACA. But the amount of gifts to the insurance industry there, the amount of stuff there where it's like, doesn't really, I mean, if you look at actually costs per individual or any metric like this, did not really inflect that stuff at all. Uh, we're still on a horrible trajectory. Things are continually getting more expensive for worse care. Um, and yeah, the Republicans have made it worse, but it's not, it's baked into the fucking source code of the ACA, how shitty it is. The Republicans just made it worse, partly because the ACA was so shitty to begin with that they could make it worse, and partly also because, and this is a thing that I think the fucking Democrats just do not seem to get at all, but they, they bend over backwards to give Republicans Republican plans, like the ACA, you know, basically Romney Care, basically the Heritage Foundation's uh, air quotes marketplace thing. And they did this. The Republicans still despise it. And because it sucks, because it's a dumb fucking marketplace plan that doesn't work, it gives everybody a way to malign it. If you actually gave people universal health care, they might go, oh, oh, socialism, that's terrible. And then they go to the doctor and it's like, oh, wait, I'm not paying. I don't have, I have a, I have a carte vitale. You don't need me to fill out five forms. The doctor no longer has to employ somebody to fight with the insurance company to get the pay. Um, I, I'm not going to go for a procedure and then months later get surprise bills for thousands of dollars that I didn't even expect. Um, you know, you do that shit and people pretty quickly, including the people who are talking about socialism and how horrible it is, start going, hmm. Maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe having a civilized society and taking one area of us to parity with where the rest of the world was decades ago, not such a terrible thing. And even if you're a hard-nosed, air quotes, conservative finance guy, fiscally conservative person, you know, at a certain point, spending a fifth of the GDP on shittier healthcare with worse outcomes than the rest of the world where other people are spending half as much as we are uh, and getting universal coverage, getting lower infant mortality, or infant mortality, lower maternal mortality, longer lifespans and growing, much better, happier people, healthier people. Um, from a fiscal conservative perspective, that's better. What we're doing is dumb. What we're doing is not, and they, they come up with this fucking lie about you know like how oh markets are good for it's not a free market you can't just go oh hey i want to be an insurance company and then do a better job of being an insurance company get in the marketplace there is a shit ton of barrier partly regulatory capture partly because it needs to be there and partly because you just don't have the resources to do it you can't have a real marketplace it's like okay i have cox cable here i've had cox cable for years they suck Every fucking day, I'll have a situation where something basic is either slow or doesn't download at all. And I don't know, I'm not like downloading terabytes worth of shit. I mean, like, you know, like some website that it, I know has plenty of infrastructure behind it just stops working or it barely works. I go to speed test and then I get like, you know, a couple hundred megabits per second. Uh, pretty much tells me with high confidence that Cox is throttling and then they see the speed test and they're like, oh, well, we have a QoS thing for them because we want you to think that we're giving you a good uh, connection. But then you go to like fucking, you know, just for example, Twitter. 
or YouTube or something where you know they have tons of infrastructure, they have a good connection, and Cox can't serve that shit for shit. And then, interestingly enough, go to speed test and then whatever it was that I was using magically is faster for a little while. Uh, so it's... I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely fucking sure that they have a QoS rule set up so that, you know, somebody goes there and then they just kind of, like, speed things up everywhere. Uh, pretty, pretty... Yeah, maybe it's just a coincidence, but I don't think so. Um, and then again, here, like, I, I have that option. I could get CenturyLink, who also kind of suck. Um, and that's pretty much it. And, you know, it's like, okay, you you have all these options. All these options um, cost a lot of money for shitty service. And they cost a lot of money that they keep ratcheting up every year. If you, don't, if you don't pay attention and you just have Cox on autopilot, you might start at like 50, well, years ago, start at like 50 bucks a month and be paying over 100 bucks a month, 120 bucks a month for the same service. And that's not inflation, that's hyper, hyper inflation. It's just that they know most people don't care. And you can get them to kind of reset it a little bit if you call them every year, if you don't mind taking like an hour of your fucking time, uh, because they know most people don't give a shit and they have this, uh, they, they've got you on this monthly recurring plan, so they could just, you know, uh, you, you're paying more taxes to Cox than it would cost for real municipal internet that would be faster, better maintained, and actually accountable to people. Uh, we have this horrible lie also that government somehow is bad at stuff and they're not accountable to anyone. You can fucking vote for the people running the government. You can, you know, and, and I understand, and I'm, the first person to complain about some of the, the limitations of voting, but it works. And it, this is one of the reasons actually, I think why I, I get really angry and upset with people who talk about how voting is pointless and all this. This is a fucking lie. It is a lie perpetrated by, I mean, frankly, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, and frankly, also like people like the Kochs who want you to think your vote doesn't matter and then they get you not to vote, and then you let random shit just kind of accumulate, and then you end up with terrible stuff. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's like, you don't vote. That's great. Uh, and you know, you know how important voting is or how not important it is? People are fighting constantly to be able to take away your right to vote, to be able to take away, to make it harder to vote, to make it, you know, force people in certain areas where they lean Democrat, to have huge lines, to force people to, you know, just have to pay attention to all kinds of minutia details. It's so dangerous also that they've got it set up so that running for office is a giant pain in the ass, requires way more money than the average person can muster, way more time, effort, and dedication. It's like, you know, you say you want to run for Congress. Say, in fact, let's set our sights a little bit lower. You want to run for state house in Arizona, and state house in Arizona, just to be clear, pays very, very little. Um, people complain about Congress paying like 170, what is it, 172, 4K. I think it's 174K per year. Good benefits, all of this. I complain about it too, but not because I inherently think it's bad, um, but because you know, like people are getting paid really well to do a lot of things like campaigning collecting other money from other people, all of this kind of stuff. But paying people who are in office a decent amount frees them from having to find another job or have a side hustle or whatever. And I know a lot of people who are like, oh, well, you don't want people to, to just like be lazy. And, well, the problem is if people, if somebody gets into office or wants to get into office and there's a big oil company that has very deep pockets and they're like, hey, you know, so kind of a pain in the ass to get in there. Uh, we can help you a lot. Um, that person might think about it. And then they can go, sure, here, just shovel the cash, you know, dump trucks full of cash, come up and just pour into your, into your campaign. You get into office and now you're like, eh, hey, why don't you, you know, I mean, that environmental regulation is kind of inconvenient for us. It's costing us a little bit. Why don't you vote against that? We don't, you know, or, you know, Here's this, here's this document that would be, we'd really like you to put it forward as a, as a bill or put this 
as an amendment to some other bill. And people do it because, you know, they're so desperate for money. And I mean, it's a thing where you almost can't blame people for doing it. I mean, you know, it, McCinema is, I, I think, one of the the worst, most cynical people that I am aware of. Um, but I can see the thought process that she has. I can see why, you know, I mean, it's not an irrational thing that she's doing. Um, you know, she has lots of things for donors, collects a lot of money, does stuff to strategically engineer her voting record. Um, and, and you could even make an argument I wouldn't, I don't agree with this, but you could make an argument like, oh, I'm here because I want to do certain things that are good. And so I'm going to, with the minimal impact possible, I'm going to engineer my voting record to look really Republican. Uh, because I think, you know, in my state, that's what you need to win. Um, I, I don't agree with her philosophy here at all. Um, but you can see an argument there and it's not a totally irrational one. It's not like there's actually, you know, you could make a case. I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong and fucked up. Um, and I know also it's not the only workable solution, but it is a strategy and a path to getting there. And, you know, I mean, it just, um, it, it, it kind of disgusts me. But also, say you want to run against, I mean, and, uh, okay, rolling back. I'm not even going to try to run against her, which would take millions and millions of dollars and a ton of infrastructure that you probably don't have. Or, you know, like the equivalent of money is a fuck ton of volunteers. You know, if you could get together a literal fuck ton of volunteers, um, like tens of thousands of people to support one person, um, you could maybe do it, but it's a, it's a hard, hard uphill battle. You wanna run for state house where you're gonna get paid fuck all it's gonna be a giant pain in the ass. I, I know people who are in the state house and the state senate, um, and it's just like, while they're there, they're fighting these stupid battles with people. They're doing things that just seem absolutely insane that they have to just deal with. And then very often, because of the structure of our state house, they're not getting a lot of stuff done or things that are passing, or things that are horrible are passing despite their efforts. It's grinding, it's unforgiving, and it's sad and frustrating. And you don't get any real thanks for the things that you do that are good. But it takes an enormous amount of effort to do that. In order to do it, just to get the signatures, you know, in a typical district, you need, you know, order of a thousand signatures. Now, I've collected signatures. You can individually I know people who have individually gone to, you know, just knocking on doors or stood outside of Safeway and things like this and collected thousands of signatures. It is doable, but it's also a giant pain in the ass. And it's something where you really need, like if you have, if you're one of these people where you're working 50, 60 hours a week, um, and, and that's a person who probably needs to be in the state, House or Senate, you know, that's a person that actually knows what it's like to work. Um, that person probably doesn't have time to sit there and go out campaigning 20 or 30 hours a week. They don't have time to knock on doors or to stand in a parking lot or anything like this. Um, it's a problem. It's a big fucking problem. And then once you do all that stuff, you know, you have to win somehow. Um, and if you're not running for a partisan seat you got to go up against both parties who are both going to want to fuck you over um i mean you know if you're running say as an independent or green or whatever both the d's and the r's will kind of be against you so you're probably stuck running as a d or an r and even then you know like in my my district um if you're if you have a d behind your name i'm not saying it's impossible to win it's certainly possible but it is a massive, massive uphill battle. If you have an R behind your name, you have a chance, but you gotta go up against uh, the asshole that they've put up. And also if you're trying strategically to go, hey, I see how this game is played. I'm gonna be a socialist, but run as an R. Probably not gonna work. Not impossible, but it's a, it's a big challenge. 
So, yeah, you think about it. And all of this, if you succeed, yeah, if you succeed after all of this, you get a very thankless, low paying job that takes a lot of time and effort. And is, you know, it instantly, as soon as you're done there, you're gonna have to run again to get reelected. And of course the state has, uh, getting reelected is easier than getting elected, but we do have term limits, <clears throat> which are one of those things I, I've talked about many times, but they sound good. Uh, but in practice, <clears throat> they mean that the people who get to win are people who have the infrastructure and the resources. So for example, if you're Greg Stanton and you're the mayor of Phoenix, um, you could probably go to Congress pretty easily. Talk to the party, you're like, hey, I want a new job that's kind of cushy and um, yeah. You mind collecting my signatures for me? You mind campaigning for me? Um, yeah, sure. And also, um, McSinema is getting out of her seat, so just, just do it. And you just kind of get ushered in. Versus if you're somebody else who wants that seat. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily like totally digging on Stanton. He's been a better representative than I would have expected. Um, although my bar is very low there. And, and the previous person sucked ass. Um, McSinema, not a good person. So, you know, it's like low bar. He cleared it. Fucking congratulations. Yeah, it's like subterranean Trump bar. Uh, Biden's better than Trump. Woohoo! You're still in the ground. I mean, yeah, but you're you're better than Trump. That's that's the fucking you know the biggest accomplishment in the world. Um, but anyway, yeah. If you're someone like that, you can do it. If you're someone else who wants to run, you know, and, and you start going out of like the state house or senate. A congressional district is big. You need thousands of signatures for that. And that's just to get on the ballot. And then you need to get people to vote for you. Big challenges. Uh, if you want to run for Senate, U.S. Senate, or governor, or any of these statewide positions, you have to campaign across the state. Now, if you are retired, um, you have some chance there, maybe. But if you're not, and you don't have a lot of resources, I mean, it's just a fool's errand to try to, you, know, you need something going for you, really, um, that lets you do it. And I mean, there are examples like AOC of somebody who, you know, gets in, but AOC was in a district with a very weak incumbent, despite the fact that he was like massively, you know, entrenched, let's just say, he was very vulnerable in a lot of ways. And she had the, um, the, I'm completely forgetting the name for a second, the DSA in New York, who are very good, as far as I can tell. They're very good organizers. She was a good organizer. And even then, not a slam dunk. Um, made it. And then once she got, the nice thing is it's a D seat. So once you get in, past the primary, you're kind of sailing through. Uh, but it was a big challenge. And if you're not AOC, um, I, I still encourage you to run, but you know, it's fucking hard. Um, and if you're going to do it, do it in a way that is strategic and is likely to, to succeed. Um, yeah. But anyway, with that, um, it's enough about supply for now. Um, we have a world filled with resources, um, and all of these resources would be more than enough for all of us to live very nice, comfortable, happy, healthy lives. Um, and yet for the greed of a few, and, and I mean, to be fair, it's not just like the couple hundred billionaires that are greedy that fuck everything else up. Uh, it's also everybody else who's greedy at a low level kind of like tearing each other down and not working together. Cause it's like, I could be a billionaire, so I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and fuck everybody else. It's like, yeah, first off, probably not. And second, if you'd work together with everybody else, you'd be in much better shape. And that's a hell of a lot safer and more likely path than you potentially winning the lottery a couple times in a row. So with that, um, yeah, the world, I always, just to end this with, our, our world is what we make it. There's, I, I don't, I, I'm not a religious person. I don't think there's any inherent uh, ethics or morality in the universe. 
there is the ethics and morality that we choose to create in it. Uh, there are the consequences for being a shithead that we choose to create or not. Um, there are the rewards for being a good person that we choose to create or not. Um, the world is what we make it. Make it better. With that, um, thank you. Stay tuned.